If you will, turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be in verses um, 21 through 26. We are working our way as we have been through the Sermon on the Mount series, and um, I'm going to read this text, and then we'll jump in. All right, let's go ahead and read it. So Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26, if you'll read with me. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with, with, while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown in prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. Let's pray. Lord, we just uh, come before you. Your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path, Lord. And I just pray tonight that you would teach us, O Holy Spirit, from this word, that you would open our ears and that you would give me uh, effective communication, Lord, of what you've shared from your word here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going through our Sermon on the Mount series, and the Sermon on the Mount is obviously, it's a beautiful text and maybe just to kind of re-catch us back up. So Jesus has called disciples, and they are sitting on a mount. And ultimately what Jesus is doing here is he is, he's been proclaiming the kingdom. And he is showing us what the economy within his kingdom works like, what it looks like, what it means to live the good life, what it means to ultimately be a child of God, what it means to be a follower of Jesus in his footsteps. And so he's proclaiming, even, even as he goes through the Beatitudes, that word blessed in the Greek is makarios. It could mean like blessed or happy. Or one of the ways that we could sort of you know, embody the idea of that word, for example, is the good life. The good life is for those who are peacemakers, right? And so he's showing people just the, the way that God is ordering life within his kingdom. And now people have said things about maybe Jesus' teachings, and maybe there's accusations potentially, like we looked at a couple weeks ago, that maybe, maybe he's not really upholding the law. He doesn't follow a lot of the customs and the traditions of Judaism, and maybe he's got some sort of rogue teaching that really isn't, fo- that isn't following with that. And that's where we see in the prior verses there, we'll look at it real quick, and it just says, um, He says, verse 17 in Matthew 5, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Now, Jesus is going to fulfill the law in in really a couple of ways. One, he is going to embody the fulfillment of the law. He is going to live on earth as a perfect human who, who keeps all of God's laws all the way through for all of his life. And in so one sense, he's fulfilling the, the requirements of the law. But ultimately, too, there's another element that Jesus is bringing forth, and that's the idea of what I am teaching about the law that really fulfills the law is to get to the root and the heart behind the law. And so that's what Jesus really begins to do, and that's what happens in these next six teachings that we see that birth from this section. So Jesus moves out of that about fulfilling the law, and now he comes in, and we see here where he says in verse 21, you have heard it said that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder will be liable to the court. But I say to you. So what Jesus is doing is he's pointing back to the Old Testament, he's pointing back to Deuteronomy, to, uh, to the Ten Commandments, and he's, and he's quoting from there. And then Jesus does something, and this is why people always said Jesus taught as one with authority. He, he looks at everybody and he says, but I say to you. And Jesus is basically unpacking the idea of what those commandments really are, what it truly means 
to embody and keep and follow what these commandments are, are, are at, at their core, at, at, their, at what they're really after. Not, not, not outward conformity, not legalism, but something about the heart behind it at its very core, which, which leads us to break things like murder or like adultery or like the dishonor of our parents. But ultimately, they trace back deeply into the very heart itself. And so Jesus is, is going and he's unpacking these ideas uh, for us. And so let's just take a quick look. Now, Jesus is about to get into the idea of anger. So he says, You've heard it said the anxious were told, You shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder will be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be guilty before the court. You murder, you're guilty before the court. You're angry, you're guilty before the court. And in some ways you can sort of feel like, is, what, what's going on here? There seems to be sort of a disconnect. Like, is Jesus really elevating this here to, to this piece and saying that, that anger is on the same part? Like, what's going on? And Jesus wants to get to the heart of the matter behind it. See, anger is... It's something that we don't hold and house within our bodies very well. Now, there's a type of anger, you know, where we can, in a moment, feel like a zeal and an anger when we see evil. And when we see, like, if, if you know someone that is, is hurting someone else or taking advantage of someone else, there can be almost like this righteous anger. But one of the things about anger that just doesn't work so well is for us to hold that anger and it, and it remain with us. Um, you know, in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about uh, be angry and yet don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because anger, just when, it, when we hold on to it for too long, it's, it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful force. And oftentimes when we hold on to it, it has a corrupting trait within inside of us. And so Jesus wants to warn against these sorts of things. And so he's, he's begun to, to pull anger up and say, the person that murders, at the end of the day, what's in their heart? It's an anger. It's an anger that they've housed, a hatred that has festered its way. And, you know, and, the, and the path to, 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 a, to a violent sin like that, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like somebody woke up one morning and just said, I'm going to go from an ordinary nice person to like a murderer today. I just feel like it. it it's about compromised choices. It's about unresolved anger that has gotten into their heart. They've held on to it, and it's led to bitterness over time, and it's begun to fester more and more. See, anger is like a drug. Because the, when you exercise anger, like take, be angry about something and then punch something. Like that, that, that actually, it, it births something in you. It awakens something in you that begins to grow more and more. Exercising that anger in that way, in an unrighteous way, is not a good thing. It's starting to get its claws into you and own you even more. And it's pretty soon, that's the thing, is you, wanna, you, you tend to, to lean into that even more and more because it can feel good. It can feel like you have control. It feels like you're, you're making things happen. And that anger, just wanting to do something about something, can become this very powerful force and this pressure that builds inside of a person. And then one day it can just erupt. Now, it doesn't always erupt. I think there are people that, that uh, for example, Jesus has talked about killers, murderers, right, murderers. And yet there are plenty of people that have had murder in their heart. They just never acted on it. And there are plenty of people on the path to that that could go in that trajectory in that, that way of becoming one, one day that. But Jesus wants to elevate up and say, you take another human, another person, and you look at them, a person created in, image, in the image of God. And if you start to harbor anger towards that person, you're guilty. You're guilty. And, and, and in a way, it kind of, it's sort of puzzling, but I, th I think maybe one of the ways we can see that growing in a person and how anger can begin to fester and overtake is, is really in, uh, in the story of Cain and Abel. We'll just look really quickly there. Let's go to Genesis 4 for just a second. All right, I'll just read from verse 1. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain 
And she said, I have gotten a man child, and with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, brought the firstlings of the flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had no regard, no, excuse me, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you, not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you. So we have here just a story of, and we're not given all the details, but you know, at a, at a very grand scale, we have Cain is angry. Cain, in the next verse or so, kills his brother. But what happens over time is, is, is a story that's not told in living color that we don't see, is that days, weeks, and months passed where somehow his anger projected towards his brother and that envy and that strife and that jealousy or whatever was going on inside of Cain's heart began to build in a way that made him angry and hateful and despiteful of his brother so that one day they go out into the field and he murders his brother. And, and I guess part of the point is that, that anger is a dangerous thing. And ultimately, in the world, God the, you know, with the values of the kingdom, God created us to live in beauty and harmony and fellowship with one another. He didn't, he didn't create you know, stories like Cain and Abel where we're at strife and we murder one another. He, he didn't create us for all this adversity and conflict that comes and is ultimately rooted in, in this anger in us. But that's the world that we've, that we've come in. But in the ordering of God's economy, God is working to reverse that in the kingdom itself, to reverse so that, so that we live with love and peace. And you start thinking about some of the sermons, of the, on the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, or, the, or just the teachings of Scripture, that we learn to make peace, to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, that when we're smitten, we turn the other cheek? What? But there's something about the way that God wants us to live in the world that, that we begin to reflect what it is to live at peace with those around us. Now, this is not, not about legalism. This is ultimately a, a state of the heart that Jesus wants us to be in. And, and I guess I actually want to pause and say this just so that we can hear. I don't want us to say, I don't want you to hear me say, we need to try to not be angry people and we want to, you know, try to be nice, tidy, good people. Because there, if you read this, I hope, I hope that throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount, you feel an utter inability at the same time to keep these teachings. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, like, who hasn't gotten angry? Like, in, in a bad way, right? I'm not talking about a righteous way. Who's been angry in an unrighteous way? All of us, right? And you go through these teachings, and you begin to feel, in a sense, almost like a failure. We won't be able to keep it. And I think that's part of the point, is that we can't keep the law, right? We know Paul's going to unpack this idea later. Ultimately, Jesus is going to bring about you know, the fulfillment of the law so that by grace, we can be saved. In fact, if you're, if you're not actually in Christ and you hear these teachings, you're leaving listening tonight and it sounds beautiful. Yeah, we want to we wanna live in a world where there isn't strife. We don't hate our brother. And we're not angry. We live at peace. And you can, in the flesh, try to strive for that sort of thing. But if you're not in Christ, that's going to turn one of two things. You're going to become very legal, and you're going to also become very disappointed and disgruntled because you'll never truly be able to do it. We can't even do it. But the good thing is, is that God has given us his Holy Spirit. And over the course of time, if we will surrender not, not to, uh, to doing the, the deeds of the flesh, but if we will surrender to the spirit that he's placed within us, then he will begin to transform our heart more and more, like he said in Jeremiah, where we, the law is written on our hearts. And that we live more and more, not in anger, but in peace. 
and the way that God designed us to live. And if, and if you have not found Christ, that's the first step, friend. It's, it's to receive Christ. It's to be filled with the Holy Spirit because he who is holy can make you holy. That's that process we call it sanctification. It's almost like God's, God is making you a saint over the course of time, over the weeks, the months, and really honestly, especially with anger, the years. Because if, if anger has ever been in your heart, and I know for some of you it has, it takes a long time to overcome that thing, friend. Because it can work its way down in you and own you. And it becomes very hard to look at anger in those moments where it rises up and say, no, no. Because what happens is that when we look at our brother, let's go back here to the text again, back in Matthew 5. When you're angry with your brother, you're guilty before the court. What often happens is that when we hold on to that anger and that, that, that little voice in our brain starts to go on and we begin to, to look at a person and we harbor feelings towards them, we might even like almost imagine actions they commit against us or things we would say at them and all sorts of things begin to play out. In our, and we might begin to, to almost demean them. I mean, I mean they're, that per, and, and name calling and, and, all the thing, and, and all of a sudden looking at all the things that they do wrong in life, attributing every, like just almost looking out. And all of a sudden it's like the, you've, you've created this target in a person. It might not even be a real actual image of who they are. It might not be a real reflection of who they are, but that's who you've built them up. But it's not, you've not done anything to them. The only damage and hurt is happening here in you. Jesus says, you got to deal with that. You've got to deal with the issue of the heart. And then he moves on, and he's given us a couple different illustrations of this, because that's not the only way that anger begins to manifest itself, right? The next one he goes in, and he says, he says, now, Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now, that, that word is sort of like a slang word. It's like a, an Aramaic idiom. It, it, don't focus on like the, the translation of it, good for nothing or whatever you want to call it. It's a slang put down. I mean, just think about that. You walk out into the parking lot. You find somebody that pulls out in traffic in front of you after we get out of church tonight. And think of the worst slang term. I don't know, make up stuff, whatever. And I'm not telling you to do this. Please don't go out and do this. But, you know, you think of that and you use that. You yell out your window at them or something like that. You create that. You know, they deserved it. They, they pulled out in front of me. What are you doing? You know, and you let that out. What, what's, what's, what's happened? Well, one, you've exercised that feeling. And now, now it's out there in the public. It's out there, Right? And it's funny because now it's an action. It's not just a heart thing, but it has worked its way out of you. And it's even more of a sin. Now Jesus says, it's like the Supreme Court, you know, it's like the Sanhedrin. Like, this is big time because not only have you had a wrong heart, but now that wrong heart has birthed forth something in you where you're, you, you've d done this destruction. And think about that for just a second. Like whenever you release something like that, it's like ripples in a pond. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't just go unnoticed. It creates something. If, you, if somebody offends you and you lash out at them, then what, what's happened? They've received that, right? And then how are they going to respond? Well, they can respond a couple ways, but usually when you yell at somebody something, most of the time they get angry. Now, they may, they may yell something back at you, or they may just sort of absorb it. But, but what you've done is you have all of a sudden created this strife and you've released something if you will into the world right you've contributed to all the the sin and the strife and the conflict that's floating out in the world now you've become even more of a participator with it because you've let that out into the world and you're also guilty and and that person not only is it is it messing with you now it's going to mess with somebody else you ever have somebody like yell at you say something to you that you didn't like it's hard to get that out of your mind. It's hard to get that over something like that. And all of a sudden, you can carry that. Man, I should, I should have said something. I should have done, you know, and like all of a sudden, that person is carrying this weight. And they go into their, their, next, confronta their next confrontation carrying that. Not only is it going to affect the rest of their day and these different things, people can carry that with weeks sometimes where you just think about like, oh, I should have done it. And all of a sudden, you become, let, let's just play that out for a second. You're, now that person is a defensive person. People will not do that to me ever again. I will never let something like that happen again. And all of a sudden, now what have you done to your brother? 
What have you done to your sister? What have you done to them? Now you've unleashed something on them, and not only are, are you angry, but most likely they're angry. So anger can beget anger. And, and we've probably, you've, you've seen this play out. If you've got kids, you see this play out sometimes, right? And, uh, you know, one says, you do, 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 right? You know, you started it or something like that. And the other goes back, do, 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 right? And then it's like, do, 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 do. <laughs> just kind of back and forth. And it's like, is this ever going to stop? It's just like this endless cycle. Well, think about that. Like, you call somebody something. You use, a, you use an insult. And then they insult you back. And then you got to one-up that. And then they got to one-up that. I, I was talking to a friend years ago, and he, um, he was in a, a business partnership he entered into with, a, with another brother in Christ, both, both believers. and They both were friends. Their families were friends. Their kids played together, and they, got in, they opened a business together. They were all excited about it. And uh, I opened this business, and uh, they got it started, and the business was, it was doing pretty good, you know, and, and this one person had experience in the industry, the other person was kind of like, ah, oh, just, I'm just getting in it, you know, just to, just to kind of, it seems like it's a good idea, and then we'll, we'll also invest in it, and so money is involved in things, and, um, and the business it did okay in the beginning, but the one person, let's say party B over here, didn't think it was doing good enough, fast enough, and they were getting a little bit worried about their investment, and so there became exchanges of, first there were feelings, I'm sure, on both sides, and then there were exchanges of words, and then there were exchanges of texts and emails, and then there were things said to the other person's spouse, and it began to build. And my friend was telling me, he said, I mean, it got ugly, like back in, like, and and it wasn't until a moment that we just both kind of like, the light went off and said, what have we become? What are we doing? Like, we used to be friends. We're both believers. Like, we love the Lord, and like, what is what are we doing to one another? What are we doing to our families? And they could see how anger was overtaking them and destroying them, destroying their relationship. And it just, it had to take at least one of them to say, no, time out. We need to take back from here. We need to be sober, friends, to what is going on in our heart. We need to be sober, not just about our actions and that we release, but also just at the very core, the state of your heart. What's in your heart? What goes on when you're offended? And, and, and notice here, it's not about the other person. There, there's a great book I read years ago that, that talked about that. Like, when you're offended, you need to deal with you. Like, you can't fix the other person. I mean, you know, depending on the situation, you might be able to get authorities involved. But most of the time, you can't. You can't fix the world. You can't make everybody drive right, okay? You're not going to solve all the problems of the world. You're not going to fix everybody. You're not going to make everybody act right. People are going to break the rules. People are going to get ahead. They're going to do wrong things. And you're going to be mad about it. So you're going to hold on to that anger? You're going to take it in your own hands? You're going to do something about it? Or are you going to let God be God? God says, vengeance is mine. I repay. It's not your job. God is concerned not about you saving the world, but about your heart. And what you are living in this world, what you're reflecting. Because if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then Jesus doesn't want you releasing strife and anger. And he doesn't want it in your heart. He doesn't want it destroying and owning you and your mind and, and tearing you down and making you into a person that doesn't reflect God's glory. You're not able to. You're not positioned to be those things because you've harbored it in your heart. And it's bringing judgment upon you. you got to deal with it. So anyway, we go, we go with just one more here, and we see here another illustration where he says, you fool. The one who says, to, uh, whoever says you fool shall be guilty and go before the fiery hell. In the Greek, that word is moros. Uh, it's like our, our English equivalent today of moron, right? Um, back in the ancient times, you know, words can kind of change their meaning, but it, it really was somebody that you just, it was a, it was a very big insult. I, I feel like moron might not be quite an insult as much today, uh, it almost like questioned their mental capacity. You know, you, it was just a, it was like a put down on someone. And, um, and that, that, think about that just for a second, because I think we see that play out today as well, where sometimes we're angry at someone and we almost can like dehumanize them. We almost look for ways, maybe we don't, we don't yell a, 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 
a curse at them, but we, we, we start to almost attack. And how, how often does this happen? You see this with teens a lot, social media, right? Where, where, where you can get someone and you just almost attack their character. And, their, and this is a person created in the image of God. Now, you may not like them. They might not even be like a good person. But like, do you really want to be that? Like, because when you start to do that, you begin to, 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 to come after someone in that way, almost attacking in that sense. You're, you're coming at, at someone that, that, that God created and that he loves. And, and, you're, and you're tearing and stripping them down of their humanity. And you're treating them like, like you would treat a dog that you're mad at. We, we can't do that. So, so Jesus is, is going through, and we see him just, he's going to give two illustrations for us that he's going to talk about. So he's, he wants to just get us to the heart of the matter, what it is to live, how anger cannot be something. We don't, we just, it doesn't live in our, it doesn't house in our bodies well, because it has all sorts of destructive impacts that begin to take place within us. And, um, and so we begin to see here, Jesus is also now going to say, Therefore, verse 23, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So Jesus, I mean, this is, if you've ever had an argument before church, you probably understand what this, what this feels like. You know, like if you've ever, you know, gotten in the car, and you know, this is like the, the, the famous classic story. Everybody's like a chaotic, and you're like, ah, 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 and everybody's mad in the car, and things are going on. You get out of church, and you're like, yeah, hey, hey, everybody, you know, and you got the smile on, and praise the Lord, right? I mean, but at the end of the day, if you've ever been in that situation, does that just not feel in your own heart sometimes like, I need to, I need to go take care of that thing? And, and that's just, a, that's just a, a very surface level thing. But here, here this is describing an offense, right? If, if, you're, if you're coming in to worship, you're coming in with an offering, and you remember, like, there's that thing. I know that's not right. And I know a relationship, there's that. And I said some things, or I did some things, and they have, maybe they have a good cause to have something against me. I, you know, whatever the, we don't get into the specifics. The end of the day is if you've got strife going on with another person, and they, they've got something against you. They've held something. Maybe you said something or did something. Like, deal with the, rela- God is saying, I want you to deal with these relationships and the people around you. Then come and worship me. Then come and offer your sacrifice. But we gotta address the elephant in the room. If you're coming here and you're not good in your other relationships, then wait. I know you, I got it. But you need to deal with that, because it's also, once again, about dealing with something in you. Because if you won't go resolve the anger and the strife and the conflict in your relationships, then there's a position of pride and there's a position of holding on to that, that thing, and not resolving it. God says, Mm-mm. if you're going to come before me and worship me, you need to deal with that thing in your heart. And you need to deal with that relationship. You need to, if you said some things, that needs to, that needs to be addressed. And, we, and if, if ever we just lock up, no, 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 then you're, you're in rebellion. You're in rebellion. And that's a dangerous place to be. Um, so reconciliation per- precedes sacrifice and worship here. Jesus wants us to deal with those sorts of things. Uh, I'll read real quick Ephesians 4, 26 through 32. You can flip there if you want real quick. Because I think this, uh, I do just, I remember Dave a few weeks ago talked about how he goes Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And there's all sorts of different acronyms for that that you can do. I still do that. As, I don't know about the rest of you, but I still do that in my head sometimes too. Galatians, Ephesians. I don't know why I have to say those four books in a row to, to do it. But anyway, that, that, uh, it happens to me as well. I can relate. Um, all right, so Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. We can't hang on to that anger. It just, it just it doesn't stay with us. 
It's a thing that if it lives and houses within us, it just begins to build. Do not give. And so he's just describing what it is to live in the kingdom, live in community here. Paul's talking and he says, do not give the devil an opportunity because you know he can with something like anger. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing his, with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who is in need. Now, let's go to 29 and look at these few. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Like, let your words, like not words that tear down, not words that dehumanize, not words that, that put out strife in the world, not those kinds of things. Words that edify. Because you don't want to grieve, verse 30, you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's right, as a believer, you have the Spirit of God in you. Live in line with that. Live out the values of the kingdom. Live out the economy that God wants us to live out. Let all bitterness and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with malice. So there's that, that idea of just, re- you've got to release. And so when that's holding on to you, Jesus is saying that's a, that's a dangerous thing. It's a serious problem. You've got to address it. The same story comes up one more time here where Jesus gives that, that illustration. He says, also, Verse 25, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. There's something interesting going on with this part of the story because Jesus in his illustration is almost making it he, until you have paid the last cent. There's, a, there's an idea of money which means that the conflict almost seems like an, something over money, like somebody would go to debtor's prison. Uh, and, and yet, this is a conversation about, about anger. And so it's, it's a little bit of a, of a funny, funny way that he unpacks it. And I think maybe what it is is that sometimes even over money or, or different situations of life, things can get very heated. And, you know, without getting into the, the details of this and the story of all of this is, at the end of the day, Jesus says, you got to deal with it. Make friends with your opponent. Go resolve the matter. And then he talks about this very last piece, and I just want us to, to look at this illustration. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. And Jesus, ultimately, judgment. Deal with it. And if you don't, you're going to get thrown in prison. And just watch the timeline through here. And you won't get out until you've paid the last cent. And I think ultimately what, what, what we see going on here is deal with this because it only grows. And all of a sudden you can find yourself in a situation where you're in deep. Years, I heard this story one time. Um, it was a court case where uh, a, a hockey dad had been found guilty of manslaughter. So, youth hockey game, two adult dads after the game get into a confrontation. And the confrontation gets heated back and forth, name calling, things like that. These are just two suburban guys. Woke up that morning, didn't think this was going to go on. But there's an altercation, and then there's a fist fight. And one of the guys hits the ice, and the other starts to hit him. And with the ice and the head, one of them dies. This is a true story. And that guy's dead. His kid's lost his dad. And there's another guy with blood on his hands. How did he wake up that morning and get there? And he went to prison for years. In a moment, everything changed. And anger can become this thing that is serious. And I know in here, whether you just have a little bit of anger or a lot of anger, some of you have struggled with anger in your life. And for some of you, I think this story, I think it really hits home. I've been in places and seasons like that where I've struggled with it and I felt how it can own you. 
it can get your, its claws in you, and it can like control your mind and your thinking, and it, and it carries over into other situations so that you, you become even sometimes a short-fused person. It changes you. And then you're a person that, 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 that reacts in situations. And now you're releasing things into the world. You're not acting like a child of God. You're not acting like a citizen of heaven. You're not acting somebody that says, this is what the kingdom's like. This is what my father's kingdom's like. This is what we want to live like. But your relationships struggle. You struggle. Anger shouldn't own you like that. It shouldn't destroy you like that. It shouldn't destroy others around you. It shouldn't fester in your soul. And at the end of the day, it's not just about murder. It's about the anger that leads to those kinds of things. At the end of the day, Jesus says, we always look at the high thing and say, well, I didn't do that. I must have been a good person. No, I don't want you releasing any of the junk in the world. Because you might create the next person who harbors anger in their heart, and then it festers and builds. You want that on your hands? You want to release that into people? No. We want to be the resetters of that. The God who has called us to love our neighbor as ourself. God has called us to seek peace and pursue it. And so ultimately, one day, Jesus would go and he would be accused, and he would be beaten, and he would be spit upon, and he would be mocked, and people would then nail nails in his hands, hang him up half naked, and then he had, he had the ability to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And if Jesus could show and illustrate that for us, then the call is so beautiful and wonderful for us each day to to seek to be like that in our lives, but not in a legalistic way, friend. What I want to say to you is that if you're struggling with anger, just let me very practically say this. If you're struggling with anger, obviously the first thing to do is to put it before the Lord, to cry out to him, to turn and repent, God, I did wrong. And if you've got bad relationships, you need to resolve those as well. But the way to start getting the claws and the foothold of Satan out of your life, the way to get anger out is to begin to put it before the Lord. And it's, friends, sometimes it might take time. Sanctification is a process. And man, is it slow sometimes. But we've got to constantly just put it before the Lord. Put it before the Lord. Put it before the Lord. And you will watch that over time, like water washing over a rough stone, it will smooth you out until one day you more and more reflect the image of God. You more and more reflect the character of Jesus so that people say things to you and it's like Teflon, man, just slides off because it doesn't own you. That's what God is calling us, to be people of peace, to let go of the anger in us, to let our hearts truly be people who reflect him and worship him. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you that you were just, you always set this beautiful picture of what it is to live fully human. But you didn't just teach it, you lived it. You lived it. And we thank you for the beautiful, not just teaching and words, but actual life that was set before us. Lord, give us and enable us, Lord, to turn from our anger so that we might be filled with all the things that replace anger in our heart, your love, so that we might be more available as ambassadors of God in this world to truly proclaim your word, your life, in word and in deed, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.